Welcome back my YouTube family. I am so glad you're here with me today. This is the Haxton Knits channel and I'm just going to tell you right away that this is just a kind of a quick check-in episode and the reason for that is that I selfishly took a little bit of a vacation. Uh, we did a staycation, went and visited an onsen and did a couple of uh, other more relaxing things this week which means I don't have a carefully prepared sort of educational topic for the day, but what it does mean is that I have had lots of time for knitting. So I have a large finished object, a uh, small finished object, and lots of new little cast-ons, and it does seem like several months of yarn shopping has sort of converged on my mailbox all in the same couple of days. So I have a little bit of a um, splurgy stash to share with you. Let's get started, guys. So I hope right away that you will forgive me for the sound quality in this episode. I um, Unfortunately, the summer has really started to move in here in Okinawa, and despite the fact that I have the air running, uh, I'm still a little warm, a little glitter. I have cats helping me. Um, and of course, my neighbor is outside practicing his sanshin, which is something that I absolutely love. Uh, I like especially in the spring when the weather is good to open my windows and I can hear his music drifting in across the breeze. Um, so we'll see. We'll see how the sound quality goes. Thankfully we've had sort of a sweet spring here in Okinawa. It's uh, taken its time letting summer roll in with its heat and humidity. In fact, I was out running the other day and it was just the air smells so sweet and all the flowers are in bloom. And of course, all of the little koinobori, uh, the fish flags are up for Children's Day, which just passed on the 5th of May. Um, so of course, the, the 5th of May, it is the end of Golden Week here in Okinawa, which is the big holiday season, not just in Okinawa, in Japan in general. And uh, the 5th of May is also Cinco de Mayo. So <laughs> if you're from Mexico or the U.S., you know what Cinco de Mayo is all about, and in a weird amalgamation of cultures, we went out on Children's Day in search of tacos. So that is a life here in Okinawa this week, tacos and hot dogs and Cinco de Mayo and my little vacation. There are of course tons of places to get tacos in Okinawa, which is really because of the large population of U.S. military members that are here. Starting after uh, World War II, there was an influx of American food and cuisine, and it's actually had kind of a long, uh, slow impact on the cuisine here in the area. Everyone knows of Okinawa as the place where everyone lives to be over 100, and the Okinawan diet is this hugely popular thing. Um, and we aren't doing them any favors, no. With the, the U.S. coming in, there's the influx of tacos and taco rice. Taco rice was a thing that I thought was very strange when I first got here. And that is because uh, when, when U.S. You know, military were first coming to the island following the end of World War II, uh, you can't get tortillas here. Even now, like, I'm trying to think, in my local neighborhood store, there's no tortillas. Like, you either got to make your own or whatever. So, taco rice has become a huge thing. I mean, it is ubiquitous to Okinawa. Every little shop has some version of taco rice, which is exactly what it sounds like. Rice with all of the taco meat and fixings piled up on top. So, on Cinco de Mayo, we found ourselves at King Taco, which is admittedly not the best taco place in Okinawa, but is perfect for coronavirus precautions because they just have an outdoor window that you walk up to and get your food to go. So we spent our holiday in search of tacos, which somehow also became in search of hot dogs. There's an outstanding hot dog place right next to King Taco where we ended up with bacon wrapped hot dogs topped with macaroni and cheese and fried onions. That's a very normal holiday, right? <laughs> very normal. Um, 
And of course, tacos, tacos, King Taco is directly across the street from the Futenma Cave Shrine, which is one of the Shinto shrines in the area. I'm pretty sure there's a Buddhist temple right there too. I feel like the Buddhist site and the Shinto sites kind of share with each other and are often sort of side by side whenever I find them throughout Japan. Uh, but I'm pretty sure the Futenma Cave Shrine is a building that survived World War II. It's a gorgeous building. I am not going to go into that building and show you around because I feel like it's a religious site and I don't really want to bring my camera in and film it, but there are tons of video footage and documents about the Futenma Cave Shrine. I'll try to pop one in somewhere that you can link to and check out that outstanding spot. But what we also did was we took ourselves a little vacation down to an onsen on Senegajima. So if you are not familiar, an onsen is a hot spring here in Japan, and typically they are used like public baths. So you will um, typically divide men and female into separate areas and be naked in the onsen. So you'll go all the women to this one and all the men to this one. Um, the unfortunate problem of being a foreigner here in Japan is that none of the onsens allow tattoos and my husband and I are both heavily tattooed. So um, what we did was take advantage of an onsen that had private bath options. So what they do is they pipe in the hot spring water to a large ceramic bowl. It really feels a bit like human soup, like you sit in this huge ceramic pot and they pipe in this uh, warm, salty, mineral rich water. It's really a lovely, lovely experience. And of course, while we were staying there, we had to take advantage of all of the shopping and the stores. Um, you know, I mentioned the coronavirus precautions on May the 5th. Sometime very shortly after that, they all sort of lifted for people who have been vaccinated. So now if you are a foreigner here in Okinawa and you are fully vaccinated, uh, you may or may not be allowed to go out and partake in restaurants or movie theaters or concerts. Um, the government of Japan has, depending on which prefecture you're in, declared like states of emergency. So they have separate precautions, which are basically asking, um, asking stores and restaurants to stop serving alcohol in the evening or to shut down early in the evening and things like that. So we did kind of run into that. We were excited because finally we could eat some really good food and like actually sit inside a restaurant which is funny because we didn't sit inside a restaurant. We sat like out on the patio in the terrace because it was so nice out. Um, but I did want to share, let's see, have you ever wondered what does breakfast look like in Okinawa? Uh, it's something even like I've lived here for five years, but I'm not a, a local and I don't routinely eat breakfast with any of my local friends. So for me, I don't have like a good concept of what breakfast food looks like in Japan. And we decided that while we were staying at the onsen, we would get their <coughs> like very nice breakfast. You know, this is translated from Japanese, so it says a very fine breakfast is included. And oh boy, yeah, so I guess I wasn't super surprised. Breakfast is typically leftover bits of things from the meals the day before. Um, many small dishes, actually almost all meals in Japan are many small dishes. It's not common like in the US where you'll get like a one pot meal or a like meat and one side or two sides. It's usually like your main meal and some soup and some salad and some tofu and some fried stuff, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. You know, a little thing of pickles on the side. Uh, but I will kind of cut in here. My husband and I are here sitting on the terrace at the onsen we were visiting. And uh, our meal consisted of a big pot of stew. It was like a beef stew that we shared with rice. And then we each got our own three or four separate trays of um, just seaweed salad, regular salad, sausages, fish cake, uh, bits of fish, more fish cake, uh, omelet, cold slices of pork, uh, homemade cheesecake. Oh man, these little things, they look like chestnuts, but it was like a, 
like a rice flour or a mochi outside and then the inside was filled with a cream that was flavored to taste like chestnut. Those were really good. You can tell I am an American who likes sweet stuff for breakfast. <laughs> like the most exciting part of the whole thing was for me the cheesecake and the sweet stuff. Um, oh gosh, I can't even remember everything else that was on there but it was very delicious, very nice. The weather was beautiful. It was cool and breezy. We had some scattered showers go through, but they were brief and light. Uh, so all in all, a beautiful weekend. A great way to end the holiday season here in Okinawa. <sighs> oh man, we had some good food. We had these really, really good homemade donuts. <laughs> that was breakfast and uh, you know sat on the the terrace and drank tropical fruity drinks and sat in the hammocks and ate churros it was a very normal weekend as we were sitting on the terrace at our own sen it really reminded me of just how nice this spring has been uh, we had a very long winter which is good because winter is mild here and summer is very harsh so long mild winter uh, spring has been very sweet it's been warm but with cool breezes everything is in bloom lots and lots of um, lilies and i don't even know the names of the plants here but beautiful flowers just everything i noticed that all of my neighbors were out in the water that particular day uh, it looked like they were foraging for clams or shellfish of some sort uh, which is not uncommon. I see a lot of foraging for food out in my backyard. Um, actually, the season's just kind of passed for it, but the asa harvest, the asa is a seaweed here that we call the lettuce of the ocean, and there's a really good soup made out of it. It's called asa soup, which is a simple fish broth with the seaweed and tofu. Anyway, let's move on to the like actual knitting content of my show. Let's move on to the actual knitting content because this is the Haxton Knits channel. Um, and I do have quite a few new subscribers this week. Again, this is the second episode in a row that I've mentioned that. So hello, welcome, welcome to the channel. I'm so excited you're here. Uh, most of you are coming to me through the knitting website because of course this guy, which I'm wearing right here is my Hope Point sweater, which went up in their spring and summer issue. So thank you for coming and joining me. Uh, yarn, yarn stuff. So I have good and bad news for you. The good news is I have finished my great tapestry. The bad news is that I don't have it available to show it to you right now. And that's because I decided to go and get it professionally framed. So I think in a couple of weeks, I will talk to you more in depth about that project. But I did, of course, reach out to the artist. So those of you who have been with me for a little while know I started this project because I was inspired by some history facts I learned while researching the history of knitting for my Master Knitter project. And that was that um, Master Knitters in the past would have to produce a tapestry or a wall hanging to prove themselves as masters before they finished their knitting guild apprenticeship. Um, and this image I just kind of randomly Google searched. I wasn't certain that it was going to work and so I just kind of went looking on Google to find an image that I thought would work and I came upon this lovely image which is called Winter Trees and it's by David Mitchell Designs and finally I did reach out to David and mention hey I knit this this beautiful thing that you drew I knit it into a tapestry and I want to talk about it on my YouTube channel and he was very kind and said that it was really an honor to have someone create uh, his work recreate his work in such a way and that if any of you are interested in knowing more about his artwork and his designs to send you guys over to his website which is David Mitchell's design and I'll put that link right here and of course down in the down bar so actually it's kind of interesting the picture that I did I was over on his website and noticed he now has it available as a t-shirt which is really kind of interesting I I didn't know that when I started it. I started it thinking this would translate well to knits and then I go to his website and there it is as a knit t-shirt. <sighs> I'm always two steps ahead of the trends. <laughs> anyway, so after um, spending, you know, almost a year working on this project, there was, there was some 
some hibernation time in there and you know paying respect to the artist who spent his time and effort on the work I didn't feel like it was right for me to just sort of hobble it onto a frame and do my DIY best um, there was a giant picture frame that I had picked out that I was planning to put this project on and despite doing a really large gauge swatch it didn't quite fit the frame and I just wanted to do honor to the project in the right way so I took it over to a professional frame shop and I actually really enjoyed working with them um, we kind of you know laid it out on the table and measured it and talked about what needed to happen to to make this particular item shine the best it could and what the framer at the shop Katie said was that she would treat it like an old flag and so it's going to be mounted and a whole bunch of language that I don't understand because I don't do framing and really makes me appreciate the subtle craft that comes like there's so many little crafts in the world and just uh, the joy in bringing these together to get a really nice finished object so more about that to come um, <laughs> when we were working on this at the frame shop the woman she said um, you're not in a rush are you and I said no and she said oh good <laughs> and kind of flipped through her calendar and she found the first day where she had nothing on the schedule and blocked the entire day out to frame my my lovely piece of knitting so I appreciate that they're gonna take their time to do a really good job and hopefully you guys will kindly wait a little while longer so I can talk in full about this project but of course when you finish a large object what do you do you cast on all the other objects so I have tons of new cast-ons for you and lots of new stash acquisition. I'm looking at the floor where I am arced by a pile of projects for me to grab and talk to you about and right next to me where my yarn stash is. So let me show you all of this. The first bit of yarn piggery. <laughs> it's yarn piggery. There's a lot of new yarn this week. Uh, many of you know that I've been doing my series on historical knits which I do plan to continue to work on. I'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, started with the Orenburg Worm Shawl. This is uh, one of four border pieces of it. And you also know that I ran out of yarn. So I did go ahead and buy more. Guys, this is what a kilogram of yarn looks like. <laughs> I don't know why I've never, I've never actually purchased a kilogram of yarn before, but this is a kilogram of Gist Yarn Alpaca in I think it's alpaca cloud where's cloud the colorway where's oatmeal no oatmeal is definitely not this is gist yarn and this is a kilogram of alpaca yarn so of course this doesn't fit in my project bag which makes me very sad I guess I might be able to shove it in there but as we work along I did continue I don't have a ton of progress on this particular item but I am continuing to work on this shawl and thus the series will continue on historical knits. I have um, committed myself to continuing to do historical knits until this project is completely done. The next bit of yarn piggery, some of you may remember, oh man, that I purchased this bad boy from Sweet Georgia Yarn. This was of course their advent calendar for the 2020 year. I have to admit to myself <laughs> I have no reason to buy advent calendars or like mystery knit alongs of any way. I never do them. I'm so picky about patterns. I always modify my patterns that like the idea of doing a mystery knit along and not being able to micromanage every step of the way is, is just not for me. It's not me. I'm not that kind of a knitter. But I did thoroughly enjoy getting this beautiful spectrum of color. This is of course the Winter Wonderland colorway. Her uh, advent calendar this year came with two colorways, so you got to actually pick a worm or a cool colorway ahead of time, and then a mystery knit along or weave along, depending on what you want, which craft you wanted to do. Um, but I dipped into this guy for secret knitting number three. So secret knitting number three is on its way, but it did require a few more skeins of tough love sock so sweet georgia yarn tough love sock this is the bluebell colorway and then this is my main color and i have two contrast colors 
the names of which I'm going to have to put in below because they are inside these uh, cakes of yarn. <laughs> but hopefully you can appreciate these beautiful, beautiful yarns. Um, while I don't enjoy mystery knit-alongs, I do enjoy having this like spectrum of yarn from a single company because it's at my fingertips and it's available. I, I've mentioned to you there's no like local yarn shops. There, There's a few. There's not a lot of yarn options here on the island of Okinawa. And so to have a spectrum of all different colors from various designers is really useful because when I want to dream up a project, I have it at hand to swatch and test colors with and see if it'll work. And then I can go and order more yarn like I did in this case. And uh, that's kind of obvious. I'm looking at the ground again. Let's see. These are stashed. So this is all of my uh, Tannis Fiber Arts bips and bobs left over. This is their, I think it's almost all their blue label fingering. Their mini sock yarn skeins. There's more, hold on. Then of course my giant bag of uh, Madeline Tosh. As you can see, I'm actually pretty organized here. I keep, I keep my labels in here. There's some other goodies going on in here too, but yeah. And, tush. and then here's my um, bits and bobs of Jameson Shetland Spindrift. I also somewhere around here have bits and bobs of Nick Pick's palette. So yeah, there's lots of yarn. Also in the mail this week, I received um, some lovely gifts from a friend of mine. So I have a friend who's currently living in Germany, but will be moving here shortly. And I agreed to receive some packages ahead of time for her so they'd be available when she arrived. And with them, she also sent a big box of, oh my gosh, they're like Kinder Hippos. Happy Hippos. I've never had these things before. She sent a huge box and I ate the whole box while I was on vacation. I had every intention of bringing those in for my coworkers to eat and enjoy. I'm so sorry guys, those are gone. But she also sent these adorable little crochet kits for me. And these are, um, they seem to be written in German. I haven't like opened them up yet to see if there's English instructions at all, but I'm not worried about that because I am not scared of knits in translation. As you guys all know, I participated in that knits in translation knit along with uh, Melissa from Knitting the Stash a while back last year. And so the idea of tackling some German crochet patterns, I think I'm down for that. So maybe in a little bit here we'll be doing some crochet creatures. I really can't decide which one I like more. I really like the elephant, but then the monkey comes with a little banana. They're really cute. All right. This one did not come in the mail, but I did rece uh, receive. I did do a little bit of yarn shopping. So while we were on vacation, we were uh, down closer to the city of Naha. And so I was able to get into some shops that were a little bit farther out, you know, a little farther than I want to drive on an average day. And I bought several skeins of this stuff. So this is UV cotton. And I have tried as hard as I can to figure out the company that makes this. Um, it's written here. It's here. I'm pretty sure it's pretty sure it's this one. Uh, but I can't translate it into a manner that that translates into anything. I can't find it on Ravelry. I did find a picture of this label on an eBay listing for some like crochet face masks, I think. But alas, I cannot find the brand on this. But this is UV, co UV cotton, 100% cotton. And this is a cotton polyester because it's got lame. It's got a little bit of sparkle in there, which is the polyester. And at first glance, these look like decently sized balls of yarn. Uh, but alas, this is Japan. And for some reason, all of the balls of yarn come in like microscopic sizes. Uh, you can see straight through these because there's basically, I think it's a 25 gram. Yeah, 25 gram ball of yarn. I don't know why. I don't know why everything comes in little teeny tiny 25 grams when I want obviously kilograms of yarn. <laughs> but uh, I did buy several of these guys with the thought of maybe knitting up a summer top, maybe a little stripey knit tank top or something like that out of lightweight cotton. I think that would be fun. So more to come on these guys. I only brought these two up because I have obviously like 
an entire bundle of them to make enough to make a shirt for myself. All right, last yarn acquisition is also a new cast on. Oh. I put all of it in this bag because I knew it was going to be big and I was going to need a big bag. And as you can tell, I have already completely filled this bag. So this particular bag is the Silver Shed. That's the, the company who makes this bag and I purchased it at the Stitches United when I was there mm, several years ago now. And this is what's inside. This is a mosaic blanket. It was a Vogue knitting pattern that I had lying around in one of my magazines, but I will link to the Ravelry project page below if you're interested. And I think it's turning out really beautifully. Uh, one of my coworkers asked me to knit her a blanket. I don't know why I told her yes, because I don't knit for other people as a principle. But I have been wanting to knit this, and I also don't need another blanket, so it turned out to be okay. It turned out all right. Uh, but of course, with a blanket of yarn, you need a blanket's quantity of yarn. And so also arriving in my mailbox this week was Valley Yarns. This is Haydenville Bulky in the colorway is blue, very original, and silver. And I'm already six skeins deep into this project. That gives you an idea of how much knitting came, came along. I have about 14 skeins of each of these. So we are approaching, what, one third of the way done here. Don't make me math on camera, guys. It's not, it's not fair. So hopefully this will be done. It's funny because I'm knitting for another person. I'm treating this very much like when I test knit a pattern for another designer. I'm like, must work on this. This is the only thing I want to work on. Um, but thankfully for me, it's big and bulky and requires a chart, so I don't have the opportunity to carry it around with me all that much. And as a result, I've had time to work on all my other things. So let me show those to you now. I have a new cast on and a finished object all in one. This one here, doo -doo -doo -doo. <laughs> I'm calling this secret knitting number two. Um, so this was a pattern that I originally wrote up quite a while ago. I wrote it up when I was in Alaska with the intention of it being worn like a smoke ring. Uh, I've talked about this before on my previous episodes, but the, the knitting co-op up in Alaska um, knits Kimu fiber items and they knit these very lightweight cowls. Now this is not knit out of Kimu, this is knit out of uh, alpaca, silk, and wool blend. It's funny, I always lead with the fiber I'm most excited about instead of leading with the fiber that has the highest content. So I guess this is a merino wool alpaca silk blend. <laughs> if there's even like a hint of cashmere in the yarn, I'm going to tell you first off that it's a cashmere yarn. I think that's fair. I think, you know, <laughs> lead with what you're excited about. It is way too hot in here to keep wearing this though. So when I originally wrote this up, I was living in Alaska, but I was pretty freshly back from my first time living here in Okinawa. So 2010, I was living here in Okinawa. 2015, living in Alaska, and then now I'm back in Okinawa again. So as I was knitting this, I was actually thinking about um, a pattern that you see often here in Okinawa. So there's a weaving technique done here called ikat or um, kasuri, and it's done by first um, warping and then tying off sections that you don't want to receive dye in a particular pattern, and then you know, taking it off, dyeing it, and then weaving it so that as you weave it creates these little patterns. And one that is particularly well known is this sort of, I call it an OXO pattern. And it's interesting because um, when I say OXO, I automatically think of fair idle knitting with their OXO pattern. But this one is of course woven and there's a fun little um, play on words here, which I unfortunately, you're going to have to look up because I'm not going to get it right because I don't speak enough Japanese. But basically there's a phrase and certain words in that phrase are also the same words for the letter, for the numbers four and five. And so it's, as you can see, like five dots and four dots. And it's a phrase about, it's about love. So women here will weave this pattern wishing that their husbands will come to visit forever, like will we'll come and be with them forever. 
um, and it's a play on words on the letters four and five. So you guys are going to have to go find you're going to have to go scavenger hunt for the full story on that. If I can find it, I'll link it below for you. Uh, but it is a pattern that is seen very often here. You'll usually see it on sashes for like the obi sash for, for men to wear around their waist and other such items. I have gone a long way off topic to tell you <laughs> that this is a pattern I wrote up a long time ago, but for whatever reason never posted up to share. So it is now available for you. I'm calling it the Fusion Cowl. And the reason I'm calling it that is because it's a fusion of the Alaska technique of like the lightweight lace smoke rings and the Japanese kasuri weaving pattern. And if you are interested, it is available on my Ravelry store. I've set it up kind of for donations. So you can, if you want, buy it for, I have it set for three US dollars. Or if you aren't really in a place where you can support local designers, there is a coupon code available in the description where you can receive the pattern for free. Or if you would like to make a donation of one or two dollars, there's also a couple of coupon codes in there. I hope I set that all up right. I think it actually works out to be a little bit less than one dollar, a little bit less than two dollars if you use those coupon codes. Uh, but those are up and available on my store now if you want to. Otherwise, Let's move on to the rest of the things that I've been knitting. Oh yeah, there's no way this is staying on my head very long. I think I've demonstrated this before for you, but smoke rings, they're meant to be worn kind of like a babushka, like a hood. And then you would take your big heavy jacket and you would pull your hood up over it and then your face would be nice and warm. And these are things that I never thought I needed in my life, but then I lived in Alaska and realized that I love the cold weather and I love bundling up. So let's move on. For the last of the works in progress this week, we'll just give you updates on what's in all my bags. You guys remember when I talked about all these bags, you know I made I made all these. Um, oh, I can't tell you about this one. This one's secret knitting number three. Um, yeah, I can't. I got all my little bits of yarn in here though. These are the original, original bits of yarn and swatches from that um, thing, but there will be much more to come about that a later time. I've made some progress on my waiting for rain shawl. This is, oh, I love this. I love this pattern and I love this yarn and I love the way it's knitting up. Um, and of course I hate the way it looks when it's all crammed on the needles because you can't see or appreciate at all how beautiful this is. But this is waiting for rain and it is knit in woolen vine yarn. So I have two colors here. The sort of off-white color is her solstice colorway, and it's on the Volca base, which is a cashmere yarn. As we have already learned, I lead with the fiber I'm most excited about. I think it's a cashmere nylon, merino nylon cashmere blend. And then the um, pink yarn is her nouveau base, which is a merino single, and the colorway is fairy hair. So this guy has got some progress on him. I thought I was going to like just steam straight through knitting this project and then be done with it, but I I got the cast on. It's like I had to start casting on all the things. So um, I think I only have one more lace section and then a bunch of garter and then the lace bind off and it'll be done. Gosh, how can you not love the Lundwein yarns? Let me, let me just it's so squishy and so like there's substance to it it's like not um it's not a wimpy fingering weight yarn for sure and then this one even though it's a single and normally i don't reach for singles this one is just like such a lovely fine beautiful i love yarns where it's a variety of colors but then it comes together like um from a distance it reads like a flat color and then when you get like right up on it it's all different colors. I think those are really beautiful. Tannis Fiber Arts does a really good job of that, like her crystal colorway. I'm quickly running out of time here because the, the sunlight is creeping towards me. It's late afternoon here, and where I sit, I have a large window behind me, and all of the trees are behind it. I'm gonna film this. So, I have a large window behind me, and this beautiful, beautiful tree. And then as the late afternoon comes, all of the light starts to trickle in and eventually gets in my way. Here's my 
mess of stuff I'm talking about with you today. <laughs> so we're going to wrap this up pretty quickly here. This bag <coughs> is not in fact a bag that I made myself. I bought this bag in San Antonio and it is amazing because it is a great project bag and it has Daleks on it, Doctor Who fans and it says exterminate but then it also has little crochet not crochet little um embroidered sheet on it in like an electric lime green i love this bag so 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 much it's probably one of the first project bags that i ever bought and like launched my love of project bags they're an addiction but in here i'm very happy to say oh this little thing has changed my life. This is a bag hanger. Um, they make really cuter ones than this, but it's designed to attach to your purse. And then when you go to like restaurants, you can hook it on the table, which is not a problem here in Japan, because in Japan, they have baskets specifically for you to put your purse in when you sit at the table at a restaurant. I don't know why the US doesn't have this. Um, but I have started attaching these to my project bags and hanging it to my desk or wherever I'm working and then my ball of yarn doesn't run all over the floor or jump out of my uh, desk or whatever as I work on it. So I'm distracted today. I am proud to announce that I am finally making progress with my stubborn stash. Uh, viewers of my channel will remember I did the stubborn stash knit along a while back with the purpose of you know trying to find that piece of yarn that just won't leave your stash you know you like you have it but you you've thought of things to do with it or you've started knitting and they don't work out and then you frog them I did a knit along specifically to cure that problem and failed I cast on like four things and frogged them and my stash continued to be stubborn this is some very very inexpensive line brand yarn I don't remember which one but it's bulky and I got it at like a super discounted rate at like the big box store in my neighborhood but finally there is a project on the needles for it can you guys guess viewers of my channel can guess <laughs> this is gonna be a sweater for my princess Cirilla my cat um, she is constantly cold and constantly wants to be under the covers with me and so I am going to knit her one of these and I'm kind of doing this on a, on a whim. I'm sort of doing it on the fly as I go. Um, you know what, guys? That is a lie. Yeah, I'm doing this on the fly. I did like five gauge swatches, and I drew up a schematic, and I did all the sweater math, and I measured my cat with an actual tape measure. I'm doing it on the fly, guys. You, you, you get it. Um, full disclosure, my first swatch... Um, was a complicated double knit like collar with an all over stranded color work stitch pattern knit on fingering weight yarn. <laughs> but uh, at sometime at around three in the morning, I realized that I was being absolutely insane and I just need to like make a practice. So we'll call this like the muslin. This is like the, the mock-up version of a future cat sweater. Uh, you're probably wondering what's going on here. So if you've ever, seen a pattern for a dog sweater almost all of them you have to like pull the sweater over the animal's head and then feed their arms through and if you are a cat owner unless you're one of the like lucky few with really docile cats you know that that's probably not going to work if you want to keep all your fingers and toes and skin intact um, one of my cats is very sweet very docile and probably she would let me pull something over her head but just to make life easier for everyone in the house we're gonna do this with some buttons so this is actually the same way her harness is we have a, a cat harness for when we take our cats for walks on a leash and <laughs> they are velcro so you like drape it over the back and then you take the strap and velcro but I think I'm gonna take the strap and just put a button so there will be a button a strap and button for kind of just under the front arms and for around the neck to make the collar so hopefully this will be done in a couple of days and I'll have some cute model photos of my cat. And then of course now I have 10 more balls of this yarn to figure out what to do with. All right guys, that's gonna be it for this channel for the day. I hope you are okay with this rambling long ramp episode. I am so glad you're here with me today. And as always, if you want to follow me, you can find me on Instagram and Ravelry as Haxton Knits. 
If you're knitting any of my projects, I have opened up threads on our Ravelry group, the Hacks and Knits Ravelry group for all of my projects. And what else? I look forward to seeing you guys next week. Yeah.